Hey everybody, I'm Jane. I'd like to thank you for tuning in for our May 2021 edition of Viking Club, which is called Foot Fetish, Notion Commotion, and Favorite Features. We have a lot of great things we want to show you today, so let's get started. Hi, I'm Stacy, and I'm back to talk to you about one of my favorite feet from the Viking line of presser feet. Um, we we see a lot of anxiety around here about closures, and we've tried to cover that in some past videos. And one I wanna show you is an invisible zipper. Uh, these could be used in garments, that's where I first saw them, but they're also great for home deck. So I'm gonna show you, this is a pillow I made, and you can see there's no closure, that's obvious, but I put an invisible zipper in the bottom. So I can still take the form out to clean the cover or to change it. And I wanna show you how easy it is to put that in. Um, this is the invisible zipper foot and it has two grooves on the side that the coils of the invisible zipper ride in. So uh, the first step is to <clears throat> stabilize the edge you're gonna sew the zipper to um, the directions on the packages and in most books will not tell you to do that, but it makes a lot of difference in how easy it is to put the zipper in. What I've done here is used German interfacing, and it's two inches wide. I cut it in half and fused it to the edges that I'm going to put the zipper on. Um, I like this interfacing because, first of all, it's woven, which I feel is more stable, and it's very, very lightweight, so it's not gonna add any bulk or stiffness to your garment or your home deck project. So I'll lay that over here, and I'll fuse this on. So you wanna start your zipper about three quarters of an inch or so below, say, the neckline of your garment. If I were doing this in a pillow, I would probably center it somewhere in the edge I'm gonna sew it on, but I'll pretend this is in a garment and we're gonna start it from the top a little way down. Um, I pinned it just to get started. If you can see, the um, coil rods just in the groove on the foot. It is gonna take a little bit to get past this stop right here, but I'm gonna Start sewing. I have it set on a straight stitch in the center position, and I've got a gray thread on here so you'll be able to see my stitches. If you have a stiletto or something else you like to sew with in hand to help you manipulate your project, that's a good idea. Just take care to get over the stop. And you can see in the past, I know when invisible zippers first came out, they recommended that you iron these coils flat and I can't tell you how many times I melted those coils. You don't have to do that anymore. You just put the zipper right side down on the edge you're gonna sew, line the coil up on the actual seam, and this tip will open it up and it will sew exactly where it needs to. I'm gonna sew all the way down to the end. And you're gonna sew just as far as you can. And the foot itself will stop you from going any further. So I'm gonna back stitch just a couple of stitches. Or you can use your fix. I'm gonna cut my threads. Okay, so just for good measure, I'm gonna show you how that zips up and how close it got. Okay. So now I need to attach it to the other side. I'm still gonna have my zipper right side down on my project. I'm gonna make sure they're lining up. And I'm gonna sew again. This time, 
I'm gonna place this coil in the other groove on the zipper foot. sewing in backwards. See, we do make mistakes. We're just like you guys. You can see that tip, this foot just rolls that coil right out and the um, interfacing on the back keeps it from stretching out. You know, if I were doing a garment, I might mark the seam line so I can see that I have the teeth lined up exactly where I want them. Um, these zippers work great in knits also, especially since you're stabilizing that edge with a little bit of interfacing. And what I didn't tell you, you wanna make sure you put your zipper in before you complete your seam. So it doesn't matter if your uh, pattern calls for a regular lapped zipper or centered zipper, you can still put an invisible zipper in. Let me use my fix here. Okay, so now I'm gonna zip this up and it looks a little twisted at this point. And you can see I put a purple zipper in, but you really can't see that because it's an invisible zipper. I love it. Um, so they don't come in as wide a range of colors as some of the other zippers because you don't have to match exactly. So to finish this off, you can see there's a little bit here at the end. I'm just gonna pull my edges together, put a little pin in there, put it on this side. And I'm going to change to a, a regular zipper foot. Um, you get a wider zipper foot in the feet with, that come with your machine, and that one works perfectly fine. I kind of like this one because it's narrow and a little bit shorter, and I can get really close. So I'm going to get my project under here. I have it all straightened out. And I'm gonna start sewing right there where I ended my zipper seam. Now I can see I need to move my needle over a couple of notches. I did, and I'm gonna roll it down to catch it. And I'm ready to start sewing. This is a good place to use your fix. You don't wanna back up and catch that zipper. And I'm just gonna finish the seam. So you can press that seam open below the zipper that you've inserted, and there you go. When I press that, it's gonna be a nice smooth seam. Um, don't be scared to try invisible zippers. Uh, there's nothing to cut, or and if you feel like it's not quite right, you can always move your needle a little bit or take out a few stitches and start over. They're really easy. And I'm not even gonna tell you this has a learning curve because I don't think it does. I love invisible zippers. Thank you. Hey everybody, this is Cindy. Um, it's no surprise that one of my favorite things that we have here is the stitch and post, other than all the fabric, is the AccuQuilt gutting, cutting system. Um, I am kind of a cubie. I love the cubes. I have them in four different sizes and um, they're just fun to use. You can make a lot of different blocks they have a little brochure there, like 72 blocks you can make using these cubes. Um, if you're not familiar with one, come by the store and we'll talk to you about them. It is a system where they have eight different dies and all of the cube sizes have the same basic sizes. And they just came out with the four inch cube. 
Um, now, if you know me, you know I love little blocks. Um, I, I rarely ever make a 12 inch block, but give me a four inch block and I am happy. So when Jane told me recently they were coming out with a four inch cube, I was so happy. And uh, needless to say, when they came in, I bought one. So I just wanted to give you a little, this is one of the dies. These are a foam and the dark part is part that you don't cut. The lighter foam is where the pieces are actually cut. And you can't see it, but there are blades in here. And you really, they're pretty safe because you really can't, you can press down, you really can't cut yourself. So they're safe if you have small children in the house. What makes the cut is when you place your fabric on the piece and this little mat is the just perfect thickness that when you lay it on top of the die and you run it through the cutter, there are rollers in here, and if you run it through the cutter, you end up getting some really nice pieces that are very accurately cut. And one of my favorite things is the dog ears are cut off for you. I mean, that saves you a lot of time clipping those little dog ears as you're sewing. Now, some people are a little skeptical and they think, oh, I waste a lot of fabric doing with this. Well, I, you really don't. I kind of measured my the lighter part of this and cut my pre-cut my piece just a little bit bigger. So this is a little quilt top that I made um, this, this week using my cutter. And these are some of the pieces that were left. So you really don't waste that much fabric. So on this little piece, I used my four inch cube to make these eight blocks on the outside. I used my nine inch cube to make the big spool block in the middle. I used my eight inch cube to make these corner blocks. And I used my one and a half inch strip die to cut the sashing and my two and a half inch strip die to cut the border. So it's really a fun thing to play with. There are a lot of different things you can do. The AccuQuilt website has a lot of free patterns. And we also have AccuQuilt Go Club on the first Friday and the first Saturday of the month. And one of the things we're doing as part of the club this year is each month we are assigning a block. This is the little block that we assigned last month and everybody makes it and brings it back the next month and shows everybody their block. And it's always fun to see the different fabrics and the different ways that people use their fabrics to make the blocks stand out and look different from the others. Now, these are not just for cutting out their blocks, but we have a quilt kit here in the store that I dearly love laundry basket fabrics. And this is one of Edita Sitar's patterns called Sweet Pea. It is a beautiful, quilt. You can set it together this way or with the very same blocks, you can put it together either of these two ways. Um, these are all, the kits are all made with the kind of a creamy linen look French general background and the rest of them are all laundry basket fabrics from her Secret Stash The Warm Collection. The reason I'm showing you this is because this is the star block. I cut it out using my AccuQuilt cutter. It was so fast. This is the little chain piece block that's in the quilt, and I used my one and a half inch strip cutter to cut that. So you can think about just traditional patterns that you buy at the store. There are a lot of times there are things in there that you can use your AccuQuilt cutter to, to use to cut out. So if you don't have one, come by and talk to us. We'd love to visit with you. Um, Come to Go Club if you're not sure if you want to do it. Jane always has an excellent program with information and tips and tricks on using your cutter and some ideas. So if you don't have a cutter, please come see us. They will save you a tremendous amount of time cutting out. My favorite part is the sewing, not the cutting. But this makes it so much faster to cut out your quilts. So come by and see us. We'd love to talk to you about the AccuQuilt Go system. And you can design your own little wall hanging. So come see us. Thank you. Okay, everybody, I wanna show you a feature that is one of my personal favorites. And this is not a new feature. It's actually been around for quite a while on our embroidery machines. And this feature is called design positioning. And in spite of the fact that it's been around for quite a while, we do encounter a number of customers who either aren't familiar with it or have never really gotten comfortable using it and don't realize what a great thing it is. So I wanna show you this. 
I have stitched out on this piece of fabric a segment of a cross stitch design. What I really want to do is I want to do several of these to make a, a longer series of these. Now, I could do this in an endless hoop, but perhaps I don't have an endless hoop that um, has a wide enough embroidery field to accommodate this. Sometimes our endless hoops are, are a little narrow. So you can do this very easily in a regular hoop using your design positioning function. So what I'm gonna do is, I'm gonna assume I want my, my next design to go down here. I want it to line up with my previous one. So I'm gonna put my fabric back in the hoop and I'm gonna really not try very hard to get this in here straight. I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna hoop. And loosen that a little bit and get it nice and flat. Tighten it back. Okay, now, I think you can see that um, I haven't done a particularly great job of getting this centered here or even getting it straight. I think you can see that this is slightly wonky here and um, kind of did that on purpose so that you can see how well this design positioning feature is gonna work. I am gonna actually be able to line my next design up with the exact needle holes of the uh, previous design that I stitched. So let's go show you this on the machine. Do I need to change the background or something maybe? Okay, so here we are sitting at the Designer Epic 2, and I have my cross stitch des design up on my screen. I'm currently in the embroidery edit screen, but I'm, I'm ready to go on and proceed to the stitch out screen because that's where my design positioning function is. So I'm gonna push the go button. I'm okay on all of this. I'm going to continue. And it's now going to ask me to put my hoop on, which I will do. Click that into place. And click OK. All right. Now, you see where my needle is right now. If I start stitching, this is where my design is going to start. Obviously, it's not going to be lined up at all. So, I am going to go down here and I'm going to select my design positioning function. And if I select that function, you see here on the screen, there are four steps in this function. The Designer Epic 2, as well as the, uh, the new Designer Ruby 90 and the Designer Sapphire 85, all have the four step design positioning function. And it's very easy. It's actually going to have a um, little instruction box on the screen here that tells you exactly what to do. So for step one, um, I'm going to move the blue cursor to the point on my design that I want to match. So in step one, I'm looking at the screen. And it just so happens the blue cursor happens to be at the point that I want to match up. And I can tell that for sure if I go to my little magnifying glass here and zoom into the cursor, you can see that it is right at the corner of, um, of the registration stitch from that design. So that that is the point that I want to match up with the bottom of corner of my previous design. So that's step one. That's all there is to it. Step two, I'm going to select in my hoop now. We're going to be looking for step two. We're going to be looking at the hoop. And I'm going to move this until my needle is at the point where I want my new design to start. So I need to go this direction, a little further. 
And I need to move to the right. Whoop, that was too far. When I start getting in the neighborhood, huh, when I start getting in the neighborhood, I'm going to click kind of one click at a time here. And when I get really close, I'm going to actually crank my needle down and check to see where I am. I think at this point, I'm just about lined up um, horizontally. A few clicks further. Maybe two or three further. All right, now I need to go north a bit. Check. Oh, probably about four or five more clicks. That is almost it. Okay, now I don't know if you can see here, but when I lower that needle, it is going exactly into the needle hole of the corner of that previous design, exactly in the same spot in the fabric. So that's where I want to line up for step two. So I'm now done with step two. Now, step three, I'm gonna be looking at the screen again. I'm gonna zoom back out so that you can see a little better. So for step three, I'm going to move the blue cursor again to another part of the design that I want to match. So I'm going to want to match the corner up here. So I'm going to scoot over in that general direction. Then I'm going to zoom back into the cursor and I'm going to scoot that cursor and I can drag it on the screen or I can um, use my arrows when I want to fine tune that, I look, I think I've got it just about, just about exactly right. Okay, I believe I've got it exactly on the corner now. So that is the second point that I want to match up. What's happened over here um, after step two, it has locked that previous point that I selected is now locked into place. So I know that one's going to match up. So I'm, I've now selected the point on my design that I want to match to the point on, in my hoop. So when I go to step four, it's going to take me over here. And if I do nothing more, this is where that's going to land. And you see that it's pretty close, but, um, with four-step design positioning, it allows me to compensate for the fact that I didn't get this hoop exactly as straight as I had when I did the first design. So it's now going to let me keep this point over here, the original point that I selected. It's going to allow me to keep that one locked and then rotate the design slightly so that I can make this point match up. So I need to go just slightly... Nope, wrong one. I need to go just slightly this way. And I can check. I'm not quite there. I'm going to go a little bit further. And now it's going to match up exactly. So now this point is locked. I've got this point matched up. At this point, I'm done with my design placement. Uh, my design positioning, I'm sorry. So now I can click the check mark and I'm lined up and ready to go. Now, um, let me get these colors out. I don't know if you can, I think you can appreciate here that the design is slanted a little bit on the screen. That's that rotation that I had to do because my hooping was slightly crooked. So it has allowed me to rotate that so that this point is going to match, this point is going to match, and my border is going to continue in a straight fashion in spite of the fact that I didn't get it hooped exactly straight. So this is four-step design positioning. Um, some of the previous machines in the Husqvarna Viking line, like the Designer Diamond series, the Designer Ruby 
series, those had the four-step design positioning as well. Our Topaz machines in the current line have two-step design positioning, which lets you line up um, the first point as I did here. And when you're using the two-step design positioning, actually, sometimes I even do it when I'm using four-step. If you have a line drawn on your fabric before you start stitching that you use to help you get your fabric straight in your hoop, then your two-step design positioning will help you to get this point lined up. And because you've hooped it straight, um, you're gonna be good to go, even with the two-step design positioning. So this really is an awesome tool. Um, I heard it compared one time to, uh, sometimes we're asked about a camera and whether our machines have a camera function to help you get your design lined up. And I had it explained to me once that the camera functions, that, that's, that's a fine function, but this is really much more exact. It's kind of like when you're hanging, when you're hanging pictures, if you want them straight and level, you can eyeball it and you can, you know, if you're good, you can get pretty close. Um, but if you want to be exact, you have to measure and you have to get a level. And that's what the design positioning function allows you to do. So take advantage of this as you embroider and your work will be much more um, satisfactory to you, much more satisfying and much more professional. No, you go first. Ready, <laughs> go. Hey everybody, this is Cindy and this is Sharon. And, and I love being in the video with my friend Sharon. She's, she's one of my favorite people. We're gonna talk a little bit about a new thing that we're gonna do for skill builders or that Sharon's gonna do for skill builders. We have chosen um, Sampler Spree uh, textbook for our um, book this year to work from in the Piecing Skill Builders uh, class. We meet every uh, first Friday and Saturday of the month, and we will be choosing a couple of blocks from our book by Susan Ake that um, we will try to complete at least two blocks a month and then you're free to work um, outside of the class to add to your quilt and you can build your own quilt and it'll be a sampler uh, this time and we'll be going over different techniques in quilting. Um, the book includes 106 different blocks so we have a lot to choose from and we'll have a lot of fun doing it so we invite you to come join us. Well, I've made the very first block, and this one's really sweet and simple. There are a lot of different techniques in this book. I think there are even some templates. Yes, it's that dirty T word. Mm -hmm. But um, if you don't want to come to Skill Builders, there you can also do this. Moda is doing, they've got a link on their blog that you can do it online. Um, there's the girl who wrote the book. She has her Instagram account is yard grl60 she lives in jacksonville florida and um this has been all over instagram it's it's a brand new book out i think it's going to be really popular it's a beautiful setting it's i love a sampler quilt so um these finish at six inches the little blocks and then you put four of them together and then sash them it's really a pretty book I mean, if, so if you don't want to come to Skill Builders, um, you can do it online. But I, I'd encourage you to come to Skill Builders because Sharon's a fabulous teacher. She's a lot of fun. And what, what better time could you have than to come hang out at the Stitching Post and stitch with other girls? So come on in and see us and join Please us for join Skill us. Builders. Yeah. Please join us. Hi, I'm Stacy. I'm back to tell you about our Amber Air S400 th Air Threading Serger. I love this serger. If you've ever had a serger in the past that frustrated you because of the threading issues, you're gonna love this one. Let me show you some of the features I really like about this, this uh, serger. First of all, this tray holds all the debris you cut off with the blade, and it's easy to get off, easy to empty. Uh, someone called this their M&M tray, so. Um, I've had sergers in the past that had bags hanging down and they were kind of messy. This one does a good job collecting all that trash. The cover, just slide it to the right, fold it down, it opens. There's a threading guide here, but you probably won't need it. This is so easy to thread, but in case you forget, it's right here for you. Threader, uh, sergers in the past, um, 
there have been a lot of uh, nooks and crannies you had to get into, use special threaders, get your hands in odd places to get these two loopers threaded. This, this Amber Air will thread those for you and you never have to put your hands back in here or even open up this side of the serger. To thread this machine, you can see there's a lever here. Well, the first thing you wanna do is make sure your presser fits up. It releases the tensions. Right here, you can see this is a sewing icon. This is a threading icon. So I'm gonna turn that lever to threading. Then I'm gonna turn the hand wheel towards me until that clicks. Come on. And you will, there it goes. Now you can see these tubes connected right here. So what I would do is thread the serger through the guide, down through the tension disc, just follow the color-coded pathways, and you wanna stick about an inch of the thread down into this hole. Um, I, make sure you have some slack here because it's gonna pull it through. If you barely have it in the hole and you have no slack here on the thread, it's not gonna pull it all the way through the tube. So then I would just raise and lower this lever and it will thread. The first one will come out here, and then I'm gonna turn it over to this hole, and the thread will come out here, so I would have both loopers threaded. Another thing I like, there's some decorative stitches that you can do on your serger that use uh, like a two-thread uh, wrapped edge, and I did that on a blanket around here and used some of the stretch maxi lock, and gives you a nice edge on a, say, a receiving blanket. To do that, you would have to disengage this upper looper, and the tool to do that is right here. It's actually attached to the serger. In the past, I've had to keep this little tool in a bag and hope I could find it when I needed it, because you can see how tiny it is. So it makes it easier to do decorative stitches. Another thing I wanna show you is this serger has a needle threader and it works great. We have one needle in here now for a rolled hem, but the needle threader works with two needles. So right now it's set for the right hand needle. I would push this down and you can see you don't have to hold it, it just engages. And just like on your sewing machine, I would wrap this thread around the hook into this little V groove and then push it up and it's gonna pull a loop through that you can grab with a pair of tweezers and pull through the needle. To thread the left-hand needle works the same way. You just pull this needle threader out and it barely moves, but it still comes down and you could see it would engage with the needle to the left. So a few other things on this serger I really like. It, you have the ability here to tighten up the loops on the edge so if you've ever surged something and the loops looked a little bit loose and you couldn't get that adjusted with your tensions, this will tight. This is like a micro adjustment. It'll pull those loops in a little bit closer. This also has differential feed. So if you're sewing on, say, a knit, it's this dial in the middle, and you want it to stretch, like to do a little lettuce edge, you would loosen that. If it seems to be stretching more than you like. Say on a rib knit, they stretch a little bit more than a flat double knit. You could tighten that up and it will pull it in so you're not gonna have a rippled edge. It'd be easier to hem. Those are the things I like. There's also an adjustment for the cutting right here. You can move the blade so it'll cut less or more. You can also disengage the blade completely here so those are the features I like about this serger. Um, you know, sergers will do more than just overcast an edge. And so there are two you, uh, feet kits available for this serger. This is the embellishment feet kit. I'm gonna turn it around and show you. It has cording feet, piping feet, a beading foot, and a guide that would help you make uh, piping and cording for home deck projects or uh, the eighth inch piping would even be the kind you would use for garments. Also, there's a utility feet kit, and it includes a gathering foot, um, a blind hem foot. You can also sew elastic on to garments with uh, 
a serger, and it has a seam guide right here, which is something I haven't had in the past. So if you're sewing knit, say you're making a t-shirt, you could use this guide and still use a 5 8 inch seam because you've got that marked here instead of just using the edge of your foot. This is a great serger, easy to use. We can teach you to thread it in just a few minutes and you won't have that frustration you've had in the past. Hey, so it's Jane. I'm back with you to show you a technique that I like to use on a serger, particularly on the Amber Air S400, and that is a rolled hem. Um, that's probably the most common thing that I do with a serger. A rolled hem makes a very nice edge on anything that you want a little narrow hem on. If you're doing ruffles on a little girl's dress or little butt ruffles on panties for a little girl, um, if you want to finish the edge of a scarf that you're making, or perhaps a handkerchief. Um, if you do a rolled hem, and you can choose a thread color that either blends or sort of accents the fabric that you're using, you can get really a very, very nice finished edge. Um, I like to use this on napkins. stacy has got her wonderful uh, decorator napkin hem that uses the mitered, uh, the folded mitered hem, and that's an absolutely beautiful, elegant look. Sometimes I'm in a little bit more of a hurry, and you know, I just want to make a cute set of napkins that I can get done quickly. So, a rolled hem allows me to do that. Turning a corner on a serger is kind of what I really wanted to focus on with you here in this little segment. If you're going all the way around a square item, like say a napkin, um, if you start and sew off the end and then start again and sew off the end, you're gonna have a thread tail at every one of those corners that you're gonna have to come back and deal with later, which is, you know, it's okay, but um, I prefer not to have those if I can avoid it. So, I'm gonna show you how to go about accomplishing that. And just as a preliminary here, I don't know how well you're gonna be able to see this, but there is a little metal bar right below and to the right of the needle. There's a bar that extends back toward the back of the serger. That is the stitch finger. And as you are sewing with the serger and it's forming stitches, they form over that stitch finger. When we get ready to turn a corner, we're gonna be talking a little bit more about that stitch finger. And so I want you to know where it is and what we're, what we're gonna be talking about there. So let me close this back up. I have the serger set for a rolled hem, which is just simply the matter of of doing a little tension adjustment and flipping the lever up here to the rolled hem setting. When you do a rolled hem, what happens is the lower looper tension is increased so that the upper looper thread is pulled around to the bottom, rolls the edge of your fabric under and creates this neat little hem. So, when you're gonna be turning corners, I'm gonna lay this on a piece of cardstock here so that you can see. I'm gonna start out on, this is gonna be my first edge. I'm gonna stitch all the way along here. I have trimmed my seam allowance for about, oh, about an inch and a fourth here on the second side, the third side, and the fourth side here. So this is this is my first side and I'm, I've left it alone, but I've trimmed here, here, and here. So as I stitch this, I'm going to start out and let it stitch. As I come to the end here, I want to stop when I get just to the edge of my fabric. Okay, 
I am at the edge. Now, I'm gonna lift the presser foot. Right now, those stitches that have been forming are wrapped around that stitch finger that I showed you earlier. So what I wanna do is I'm gonna tug just a little bit to the back to release those stitches from that stitch finger and that will allow me now to turn my corner. I'm gonna line my trimmed area that I um, prepared earlier up with the blade. So the blade will not actually be cutting off anything. It will be just going right along that cut edge. And I'm gonna stick my head in the way for a second here so that I can get this lined up correctly. Put the presser foot down and I'm gonna go ahead and start sewing. When I get right here, then it's gonna start cutting fabric. If you need to, you can turn the hand wheel a couple times by hand when you get to the very end there so that you can tell exactly where to turn. So once again now, I'm gonna lift the presser foot, gently tug the stitches loose from the stitch finger. If you need to, you can even kind of pull backwards on those threads to get them um, back where you don't have any slack to start your next edge. Make sure you're starting at the edge of your fabric. <laughs> stitch there and one last corner off the stitch finger tug these backwards lower this down <laughs> This last corner, I'm going to go ahead and sew off the end. Use my thread cutter. And you see that I've got finished corners here um, that do not have a, a thread end hanging off. I do have the one last one here, which there's no, there's no way around that, that very last one. But... What I will do is I will take a dab of fray check, uh, put it right on the, the fabric and the thread at that corner, let it dry completely, and then I can trim the end of that thread off and I will have nice corners all the way around my napkin or my handkerchief, whatever it is that I'm making. So I encourage you to try this. It takes a little practice to get used to, but once you do, you'll find it very easy. Thank you. Hi, I wanted to show you one of my favorite notions. I've been doing quite a bit of hand stitching lately, and this is uh, one of the new books we got. It's called Retro Stitchery, and I kind of fell in love with this little design. It's called Taco Trio. If you read here, I think it's funny. If you don't like tacos, I'm nacho type. But my grandson loves tacos. That's like a staple at our house. And I thought this would be a cute shirt for him. So here's the design. And it's wool felt for these pieces. And then the ingredients in the taco are just embroidery stitches, satin embroidery stitches. And then this is just a running stitch for the title. Um, the problem with doing this was I, I can't draw at all. I'm a very competent tracer. So I wanted to show you how I got this design onto the shirt and made it look like the picture. Um, there is a product out there called uh, Stick and Stitch, and this is it. It's a water-soluble, uh, fibrous paper on a backing sheet, and it sticks. So I traced the lettuce and tomato and cheese. And then I cut it out and stuck it on here and did my embroidery. It's the same thing I'm gonna do with this little leaf design, which I trace a little high on my sheet, but 
just cut it out. And I put the little notch on the top of this lime on here so I'd know, have a good placement. And I'm gonna just stick it to my project. Now, I can stitch, satin stitch the leaves on the line, lime, just like I did on the taco. When I'm through with this, I'm gonna rinse it and all of that will disappear and the stitches will look great. When I'm through with my stitching, I'll be back and show you the finished product. Hi, I'm back. I finished my embroidery project and I wanted to show you the finished results. I remember I used sti stick and stitch to get my um, embroidery exactly where I wanted it. After I finished, I rinsed it in cold water and voila, I have a shirt ready to wear and it was easy. Hello, my name is Karen Davis and I'm the service technician at the Stitching Post and I'm here today to show you how to use the quilt binder on our Husqvarna Viking sewing machine. In the box, you're gonna get these parts. And it's very important to put them in on in a certain order and I'm gonna show you how to adjust it so that you'll get good results. You do need, on this particular machine, you do need your walking foot. And we're gonna put this, the, pla the plate that comes with it on the foot. It's come, this comes in your box and it has a little clear piece in here. It's also very important to use a top stitch 90 needle so that you can make a, you're going through about seven layers of fabric and so you need something that's really gonna pierce into that fabric. The quilt binding that you're gonna put on, you're gonna join it with a diagonal seam and I prefer to use a 2.5 stitch length. Then when I get ready to press my seam, instead of pressing it open like we normally do for a double fold binding, we're gonna press it to the right side. And all of the seams need to be pressed in the same direction because when you put it into the binder, you don't want that seam catching on the binder as it tries to go in and it will feed smoother. So I press everything to the right side. My quilt top, I always like to do an eighth of an inch from the edge, a, a two, 2.5 or a three inch, just a little basting stitch to hold everything secure and together. You're gonna need your seam ripper, a glue stick, and three or four sharp pins. And these are the items that we're gonna need to be able to use our binder. Now I'm gonna show you how to put the binder on. You have to have the newer stitch plate that has the two little holes in it. If you have a Ruby Royale or a diamond or anything older than that, we do carry the stitch plates for those. It will not fit an SE or a designer one. So the first thing we're gonna do, we have a little tab and we're gonna put that little tab in that first hole and then screw this screw into the second one. The binder comes kind of folded up and you pull this open and it's gonna be kind of hard to pull open. And this is where your binding is gonna go. It's, I think some people call it a fence cause you kind of weave it through that fence. Then we're gonna take, put it here in the front. And you do need to use the washers on this particular screw. I do have the single hole stitch plate on because I'm gonna be doing just a straight stitch but you can use the, a decorative stitch with this particular binder and you would just take it and change it to the zigzag and you would use a, you can use this foot or there's some other feet that you could use. A um, edge stitching foot is a good one so that you could keep that straight along the edge of your binding. We're gonna load our binding in there and I like to stick my binding up here on one of my spool pins so it kind of keeps it out of the way. I have cut this to a point so that it's easier to get it into the binder. 
And just take your seam ripper. You could also use a stiletto. I just start my seam rippers always just laying right there. And it's gonna start folding right here. I have to say, these little prongs that are sticking out are gonna be the length that the binding folds over. You can take these two screws, and you see this screw is adjusted a little bit. It is the bottom one. And I find, especially turning corners, if I go ahead and adjust this one out farther than the top one, see they're just a little bit off right here, then um, I get a better result after I fold my corner and start again, because it gives me a little more extra fabric on the back side. We're gonna bring it in, and when you bring it in this way, you're gonna pull it all the way to the back, and it magically folds it in on itself. Okay. And to start it, every machine is different. So sometimes I have to adjust. I'm gonna start it down here because you really wanna start it closer to a corner. And this is the one of the tricky parts is getting it to start. It's also one of those times when I really would benefit from three hands. Well, did it not go up? Okay. Pull it up a little bit. And I see that my needle is not gonna be quite on my binding, so I'm just gonna adjust down here rather than moving my needle. And I just adjust it over. Make sure I get it good and tight. You're just going to sew to the edge. And unlike traditional binding, we're going to sew all the way to the edge. And then I'm going to do like two back stitches just to secure it. That was more than two, but just to secure it. Then I'm going to bring my foot up and I'm going to pull it back and to me. And I like to cut these stitches. Some people leave this tail long so that when you go back, you can sew the corner with these tails. I prefer just to cut them so they're not in my way. And that way I can just go back with another thread, a needle and thread and sew those corners if I need to. Okay, and here's where the, everybody thinks this is gonna be the hard part, but it's really not. I use my glue stick and I put a little bit of glue right there. And if you look, it just, it wants to fold exactly there. Just take my glue stick. Then I take a pin. And I can feel that the back of my binding is a little bit more on the back than it is on the top. And we want it that way so that it will catch. And I actually like to put two pins there. That way I know that binding is caught on the back. If you should not catch it on the back, I just take and put a pin on each side of where it's not caught and take that out and restitch it after I finish all the binding. We'll bring it back under this foot. Then you pull the binding back through the binder and pull it. You have to kind of pull it back and forth just a couple of times just to get it 
to where it's folded correctly into the binder and make sure that it's folded correctly up underneath here because it's that's where it's gonna wanna not fold and that's why it's not gonna catch. Okay, I'm gonna put my needle down. And see, I've got it a little bit too, not quite far enough over here. That glue doesn't seal real quick, so you can just redo it. You need to really kind of go slow to do this so that you get good precision on it. to go to the next corner just remember you're going to sew all the way to the edge a couple of back stitches and you're ready to turn your next corner and that's how easy it is to use the quilt binder hi i'm stacy i wanted to talk to you about some of the decorative stitches available on our viking sewing machines i know a lot of you have these and you don't use them I wanted to show you some of the gorgeous stitches. If you have Omni Motion stitches like these, you can use those as quilting stitches. The uh, this would be great on a children's garment. I've seen this one done on a little zipper bag. I know the first time I saw these stitches actually stitched out, I was very surprised at the size of these stitches because. Uh, keep in mind, these are on the sewing side of your machine, not the embroidery side. But if you have an embroidery machine, like the uh, Emerald, the Sapphire 85, or the uh, Epic, or the New Ruby, these stitches can be brought into your embroidery field, and you could stitch them out in perfectly straight rows without any effort at all. The applique stitches, like this little heart, are also available on the 75Q, which is a sewing only machine. So look into those on your stitch menu and find a place you could use those. Um, let me point out this little feather stitch, how perfect that is. It'd be a great little quilting stitch. So check all those out. There are a lot of them in the stitch menu on your machine. Hey, it's Jane back with you. If you have paid attention over the last couple of years to new introductions from Husqvarna Viking, you've probably heard about MySonet, which is a technology-based system to help you with your sewing and embroidery. We get a lot of questions about MySonet, so I'd like to spend a few minutes giving you an overview of what MySonet is all about. So when you think about what MySonet is, you should think of a collection of software applications that are related to sewing and embroidery and are designed to make your sewing and embroidery projects easier and more fun. I like to think of it as being analogous to Microsoft Office. So in Microsoft Office, you have Word for doing text documents, Excel for doing spreadsheets with numbers, PowerPoint for doing lectures and presentations, Outlook for managing your calendar and sending emails, and OneDrive for storing your files on the cloud. Similarly, in MySonet, you have a group of applications related to your sewing and embroidery. Some of the applications will be used on your tablet or your smartphone. Some will be used actually on the screen of your machine if you have a MySonet compatible machine. And some will be used on your laptop or desktop computer. The three MySonet apps that are intended to be used on your smartphone or tablet device are the Joy OS Advisor, the MySo Monitor, and the Quick Design apps. 
I'd like to give you a quick overview of these beginning with the Joy OS Advisor. When you open the Joy OS Advisor app, it's kind of like having a sewing teacher sitting at your side while you're working on your project. The app is all about education and information. The index here has advice on different sewing, quilting, and embroidery techniques sewing instruction techniques for specific projects and situations, has a stabilizer guide to help you choose the correct stabilizer for your embroidery, and it has a step-by-step -step workbook that will help you to learn the functions of your machine by taking you through some exercises to introduce you to some of the functions that you may not be familiar with. If you have one of our wonderful Wi-Fi compatible MySonet machines, you will also be able to access the Joy OS Advisor on the home screen of your machine and pull up the same technique descriptions and instructions for sewing, quilting, embroidery, and so forth as I just showed you on the tablet or smartphone version of Joy OS. This is a great educational app. The second of the apps for your tablet or your smartphone is MySo Monitor. The original and most basic function of the MySo Monitor app is the monitor function itself. This function allows you to monitor the performance of your embroidery machine if you need to walk away from your machine for any reason. This screen shows the app open and it shows that it's monitoring the screen of the Designer Epic 2 on which I have an embroidery design pulled up on the screen with three thread colors. The Sew Monitor app shows me the total number of stitches, the stitches for the color that I'm on, and I can see on the list here which color I am on at this point. I'm obviously at the beginning. It's going to keep track of where I am with the stitches. It's going to alert me when it's time for a color change or if I run out of bobbin thread, and it will let me know when my design is finished. All of this is very helpful if I have to step out of the room, step away from the machine, perhaps to answer the door, put the clothes in the dryer, see why the dog's barking, whatever might be going on. The other function that you find in the Sew Monitor app is called Design Placement. And if you've ever wanted to get an embroidery design in the right place on perhaps a pre-made garment or a bag or a quilt block, this app will be very helpful for you. Let's suppose that I would like to embroider a floral motif above the pocket on this shirt. The Design Placement app will help me to do this. I start by hooping the shirt and I open the app, which will allow me to access the camera on my smartphone or tablet. I click the camera icon at the bottom of the frame and take my photograph, making sure that I have all the parts of my hoop included in the picture. You see here the photograph that I have taken of the hooped shirt with the pocket in the hoop and this is the screen of my embroidery machine with the floral motif that I have chosen to embroider on above this shirt pocket. When I'm satisfied with my photograph, I can click the paper airplane icon, and this image will be sent to the screen of my MySonet compatible sewing machine, and it will show up in the background behind my embroidery design. Here you see the image of the shirt pocket behind the floral motif on the screen of my machine. Obviously, my embroidery design is not in the right place and is not oriented correctly. I will want to rotate this design and move it up above the top of the pocket. Here you see the design that has been rotated and moved into place above the pocket. I have rotated the design 90 degrees plus a little bit more because I have obviously not gotten this exactly straight in the hoop. That doesn't matter. I simply rotate it a little bit extra to compensate for that. And I can see based on what it looks like on the screen that it's going to be exactly where I want it on my finished garment. This would be very helpful in many situations and is very, very user friendly.
the third of the little group of applications for your smartphone or your tablet device is Quick Design. Quick Design allows you to take a photograph or a drawing and turn it into an embroidery design. Quick Design works best with a simple line drawing with a lot of contrast, so it's good for uh, children's art, children's drawings. Uh, it would be very good for perhaps turning a handwriting sample of someone in your family into an embroidery design. This particular image is from a coloring book. Again, those are simple line art uh, drawings that have a lot of contrast and do well turning into an embroidery design. So this is a great little app to play with, particularly, I think, on children's artwork. One of the MySoNet software pieces that you will use on your laptop or desktop computer is the new MySoNet embroidery software. This is the latest in the Husqvarna Viking machine embroidery software versions. It has some similar functionality to previous editions with some improvements and some additions. It has the wizards that you're used to that allow you to do certain functions in a very quick, easy, express kind of manner. For instance, setting up monograms. There's a monogram wizard. This new software has a spiro wizard, which allows you to take a, a spirograph design and tweak it and twist it and pu push it and pull it and turn it into something really, really interesting to be embroidered. Um, one of my favorite things about the embroidery software is the fonts. There are many, many fonts that are included in the software. And you see this new edition has 29 new fonts, including this really cute dog font that you see here, um, the letter A. So the software will allow you to edit designs, resize designs, combine designs, take out a part of a design that you don't want to use, change colors, and it will allow you to create your own designs as well. This is a subscription-based software, so it will um, automatically update you to the latest version. You do not have to be connected to the internet uh, the entire time that you're using the software. You just need to connect monthly, at least, so that you can get the most recent updates. There is a boxed version of the software available as well for those of you who prefer that over the subscription option. You see here the home screen of MySonet.com. This is where you would sign into your account or create your new MySonet account if you don't yet have one. The uh, three tools that are shown here are uh, things that you would use on your computer screen. The center one here, the MySonet library, is an awesome collection of designs that are available for you to use when you have a MySonet software subscription. When you open the library, you see immediately that, at least at this point in time, there were 6,704 designs. New designs are being added all the time, and the newest designs will show up first on the list. So this is the new vintage floral monogram, and I think this is an absolutely beautiful monogram. You see that it has the little paper airplane icon, so you can click on that icon and send these designs directly to the screen of your MySonet compatible embroidery machine. At this point, you do need a MySonet compatible machine in order to use the library designs. However, they are working very, very hard uh, to get a, an application up and going that will allow you to purchase individual designs from the library that you can download store on your computer, put on a USB stick, and stitch out on whatever machine you might have, even if it is not a MySonet compatible machine. So look for that coming very soon, which will expand the ability to use the MySonet library to all of our embroidery machine owners. There are two tools remaining on the MySonet home screen. The first one is the cloud. This 
application allows you to store your embroidery designs on the cloud so that you don't have to store them on your computer and so that you can access them between your various devices, including your MISONET compatible embroidery machine very easily. Project Creator allows you to produce instructions for a project that you have created including specific stitches and embroidery designs, you can create a complete project that you can save as a file to refer to later if you want to reproduce that project yourself, or you can choose to share it with friends who are also MySonet users. So that's a fun way to preserve projects for your own future use, as well as to share them with your friends. So I hope that's given you a little bit of an idea about the different parts of my MySonet and how they can be helpful to you in your sewing and embroidery endeavors. We're here to answer any additional questions that you might have, and we look forward to seeing you. Thanks for coming to Viking Club, tuning in. Um, we hope you enjoyed it and come see us soon. Bye. Bye.